So semiconductor memories, so these, these are one of the very important component like if you look into any digital system because we have seen that uh, if you want to store some information in a digital system then one possible storage that we have seen are the registers. But you see registers are quite costly because uh, for making one register, uh, one register so you will need uh, a number of flip flops and some control logic like that. So, if you are willing to store large amount of information and then you want to access those uh, com contents then uh, we need some uh, mechanism by which it can be done in a much better fashion not via uh, some uh, circuitry to uh, access individual flip flops. So, the semiconductor memory design so this will tell us like how this uh, uh, these things are done and how, where can I, what are the functionalities of this memory and uh, there are many memory chips available so diff of different types so what are the general uh, control lines that you sh should expect in a memory chip and how is the memory organized in a system so we'll be looking into these aspects so there if you look into this memory there are two broad types of memories in that are used in digital system one is known as random access memory or ram and another is read only memory or rom so in random access memory so you can perform both write and read operation and in read only memory so you can perform only the read operation so though this name random access memory is uh, somewhat misleading so it means that there is some as if there is some other memory which is not random access which is sequential access this is true but uh, sequential access memories are there but uh, they are no more used uh, in uh, in the computer systems now but the uh, both random access memory or ram and read only memory rom so they are they are they are actually random access so you there is no order in which you have to access the locations in these chips so you can tell the uh, you can tell the location address and the uh, the memory will be able to access that particular location so the, the basic difference between a ram and a rom is that the in case of ram so you can do both uh, write and read operations so either that is you can modify the content of a location in the ram or you can read the content of a location in the ram whereas for read only memory so it is you can only do read operation so normally if the information is not going to change for example say the uh, some part of the operating system which is the memory resident part of the operating system which is not going to change which is commonly known as, known as the basic input output subsystem okay so those uh, or the monitor program so they are actually kept in the rom because they are not going to change Similarly, if you are thinking about some other application where say some filtering of application where you have got a set of filter coefficients. So, this filter coefficients may be kept in a ROM and then we can uh, do the operation. So, uh, the filter coefficients are not going to change. So, they are they can be kept in a ROM. So, this read only memory is a programmable logic device. Uh, so, so, this is programmable logic device means you can program it and uh, you can uh, put some content there. So, random access memory so you can uh, the user can change the content at any point of time whereas this uh, programmable uh, logic device based read only memory so you can change the content but only uh, with some restrictions. So, you cannot change uh, the content while the system is in operation. So, either you have to take out the chip or you have to stop the uh, uh, system functionality and do some modification to the programmable device. So, apart from this uh, read only memory which can act as programmable logic device. So, there are other programmable logic devices like programmable logic array. We have seen some part in our discussion previously the programmable array logic or PAL and field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. So, we will be having some uh, we will be looking into these devices also to some extent. So, to start with we will be looking into the random access memory. A memory unit it stores the binary information in groups of bits called words. So, as we know that in case of uh, uh, in case of a register, so if I say that it is a 4 bit register, so 4 bit register then um, uh, we know that these 4 bits may be uh, uh, contained in 4 flip flops. So, the same concept we have in this uh, uh, random access memory. So, we have got a, a few locations of this uh, memory chip which are accessed together. Okay. So, these are this may be there may be 8 such bits which are accessed together. So, that constitutes a byte. So, these 8 bits will constitute a byte and 
depending upon the memory design in one memory access so you may get uh, the content of one uh, you may get the content of uh, one byte or maybe more than one byte so this is determined by uh, these lines like if you see if you see that i have got a memory unit like this that has got n data input lines and n data output lines so if you are accessing a particular location in this memory so it will be you, you will be uh, getting data in terms of n bits so if you are trying to modify something so you have to give n bit data here which will be written at some uh, a set of n bit locations or if you are trying to get the content of this uh, memory for a, for, for a particular location so the, you will get this n bit data so this individual bits of memory so they are accessed in a group okay so that will be called that will call a word so so that is known as the uh, word size of the memory so word size is normally equal to 2 bytes or 4 bytes like that so there is no hard and fast rule like what should be word size but word size is uh, never less than uh, one byte of course so so you can in your computer system so you may have different uh, word sizes so communication between a memory and its environment is achieved through data input and output lines address selection lines and control lines so the, you can think about this uh, memory as if it is having 2 to the power k words and each word is n bit so you can see, you can think that as if my memory is like this so it has got 2 to the power k such words okay and each location is consisting of n bits so this side you have got n and this side you have got 2 to the power k so if you if you you can think of this memory as a collection of cells and number of cells is equal to 2 to the power k by n so these individual cells you have got 2 to the power k by n but uh, the point is you cannot access a single cell alone okay so if you trying to if you are trying to access a single cell so you have to access this entire location so the uh, i can so there are some uh, so every location has got an address so if this may be address 0 this may be 1 this may be 2 this may be 3 so it goes like this so for example if i ask for the content of location 100 so it will give me an n bit pattern uh, that that was that is the content of that location so we have got this memory unit that consists of 2 to the power k words and each word is n bit wide so this k address lines are to be given to tell which location we are trying to access so then this uh, n bit uh, data input and output lines are there if you are doing a read operation then the content of that uh, uh, address location will be available on this n, n bit data output line on the other hand if you are doing a write operation so whatever value is available on this n data input lines will be stored in the corresponding location so this uh, control lines the read and write so they specify the direction of the transfer so this is the uh, idea of this uh, basic random access memory so each word in memory is assigned an identification number called an address so these are the addresses like the each location so this is uh, address 0 this is address 1 this is address 2 like that so this is up to address 1023 so in this particular case we have got um, uh, 1024 locations 1 k 1 kilo memory locations okay so 1 kilo memory addresses so if the k equal to 10 in this case so the addresses will go from 0 to 2 to the power k minus 1 so addresses go from 0 to 1023 k is the number of address lines and number of words in a memory with, uh, with one letter uh, that is k we will now write it in the k which is kilo which is 2 to the power 10 mega m 2 to the power 20 or giga 2 to the power 30 like that so 64 k that is equal to 2 to the power 16 so k is 2 to the power 10 and this 64 is 2 to the power 6 so that gives us 2 to the power 16 similarly 2 mega it is 2 to the power 21 now if you write a uh, whether it is byte or word etc so that will be written here like if i write like 64 kb so if i write like 64 kb so that means individual locations are having 8 bits okay so the, um, this way we can tell the number of uh, locations in the memory chip so so if you do try to do write and read operations so first of all we will look into the write operation which is uh, to transfer a new word to be stored into the memory 
So, for that what we have to do is that we have to apply the binary address of the desired uh, word to, uh, to the address lines and apply the data bits that must be stored in the memory to the, uh, to the data input lines and we have to tell the write input. So, we have to, so if you look into this uh, diagram for writing we have to give the address lines, we have to give the data value and we have to keep the write control signal. So, read control signal should not be activated. So, that is how this write operation will take place. Similarly, we can uh, do this uh, read operation which is basically transferring a stored word out of memory. So, here also it is similar. So, apply first the binary address of the desired word to the address lines, activate the read input and so then uh, the content will be available on the uh, data output lines. So, commercial memories uh, they sometimes provide two control inputs for reading and writing in a somewhat different organization. So, basically the um, problem that we have with the configuration that we, we have taken like say we have said that we have got a memory chip uh, memory, memory like this and it has got two controls one is read another is write. Now, in this situation how do you tell? that uh, what which uh, which operation you are trying to do so it may be the situation that i don't want to do a, I either read uh, neither read nor write operation so i don't want to do any of those operations okay so somehow there should be a mechanism by which i should be able to uh, distinguish between the situation that uh, say i don't want to do, do any of the operation so this uh, one possibility is like this this memory chips they come come with an enable input so, the, if this enable line is 0, then whatever be this read write value, so no operation will be done. If enable line is 1, then if the read write bit is 0, so that is a write operation and if enable is 1 and read write is 1, that is the read operation. So, in many processors, it will, we see that it is written as read write bar. Okay. So, uh, so, the control line is written as read write bar. So, if, if this enable is 1 and read write bar is equal to 0, that means we are trying to do a write operation. Similarly, if we, this, this line is 1, that means we are trying to do a read operation. So, this is the uh, organization of this uh, control signals, memory read write operations and all. So, typically this memory access can be uh, represented by means of a timing diagram. So, what happens is that this memory chips they are connected to uh, some processor for this which will be doing the, the operation. So, in our uh, from our uh, school days, so we know that if I have got a processor, uh, then this processor and memory uh, they are connected uh, by means, uh, so they are connected by means of some lines and then whenever processor needs to uh, write something onto the memory, so it will uh, send the data to the memory. Similarly, when it wants to read, so it, it, it gets the value there. And this line that I have shown here, so this is not a single line. So, uh, we will have the situation like this. So, these lines they can be divided into uh, three di at least three different set of lines. So, this is this side is the processor, this side is the memory. The first set of lines they are the address lines, then we have got the data lines, these are the data lines, and there are some control lines these are the control lines. So, which basically the read write or this uh, enable, so they go as the control lines. So, this uh, processor how does it operate is that, so processor operates at some clock. So, it uh, so this suppose this is the clock signal where the uh, duration of this uh, clock signal period is 20 nanoseconds. So, this is just an example. Now, this uh, so at the at T 1, so this uh, the processor will put the address onto the address bus. So, address will be valid for the entire time T1, T2, T3 all the three cycles and then after putting the address onto the address bus this memory enable signal is made high. Then, then this read write bar line, so this is made low because this is a write operation. So, this read write bar line is made low, but before that so data is put onto the data bus. So, you see that these two points, so they occur simultaneously that is the memory address is made a valid address is put onto the address bus, valid data is put onto the data bus. After that the memory signal, memory enable signal is given and this read write control is made low, so that it is a write operation, then the memory will be doing the operation. 
So, so how much time this memory takes to respond with the data? So that is given by the uh, cycle time. So this is uh, this memory, uh, the access time and cycle time of the memory must be within a time equal to the fixed number of CPU clock cycles. So access time means how much time it takes to access the memory. So for how much time this read write uh, this uh, address uh, input then this read write control input should be valid so that memory will understand it and cycle time means after you have put the address data and say control lines after how much time the operation will be done by the memory so that is the cycle time so this memory enable and read write signal must be activated after the after the signals in the address lines are stable to avoid destroying data in other memory words because otherwise what will happen is that um, if these uh, signals are given before they become valid so they are having some wrong values and if you give an enable and this read write signals before that then the memory will access some other location and that location's content will be lost that location content will get destroyed so this is the problem so it is always uh, advisable that we first uh, put this uh, make this address and data lines valid and then only we give this control signals so this enable and read write signals must be must stay active for at least 50 nanoseconds so this is a typical situation like if your clock cpu processor clock is uh, of period 20 nanosecond then this uh, read write signals um, uh, are expected to be active for about 50 nanosecond so next we will be looking into the read operation so in case of read operation also uh, the CPU can transfer data into one of its internal registers using this negative transition of T3. So here also the operation is like this, the address, valid address is put, memory enable signal is uh, made active and this read write bar line is made active. So this is made high, so this is read, read operation is done. So, so after 50 nanoseconds, so if uh, the memory cycle time is 50 nanoseconds, so after 50 nanoseconds the data is available onto the data output. So this data valid comes here. So processor should uh, take the data at this point. So it has started the write operation at this point, but it should take the value at this point. So this uh, um, negative transition of T3, so the, this falling edge of T3, so this should be used for uh, storing the data into the CPU register because at that time only the data is valid. The data is definitely valid at this point of time. So this is the way this uh, um, read operations will be done. So if you look, going back to the types of memories, so in random access memory, the word locations may be thought of as being separated in space with each word occupying one particular location. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, we can think of it logically as if uh, we have got in case of this random access memory, so we have got a set of locations, so, so th all these are random locations and you can access any of them randomly. So there is uh, no fixed ordering in which you have to access them. On the other hand, the sequential access memory information is stored in some medium uh, is not immediately accessible but is available only certain intervals of time. So basically, uh, this is typically this is true for magnetic tape, uh, disk or tape type of devices. So there what happens is that we have got uh, uh, this type of uh, disks and there are some tracks in it. Okay, there, there are some tracks which are further divided into sectors like this and there is a read write head. So there is a read write head, so uh, suppose this is the read write head. Now so this disk rotates and accordingly whichever comes under this read write head, so that uh, uh, value is read at that point. So, so since this disk is rotating, so after you have accessed say this location then only you can access this location. If I assume that the disk is rotating like this. So you, you, you cannot uh, access randomly. So it cannot be the case that first you access this, uh, then you access this, then you access this. So that cannot happen. Because if, if the disk is rotating like this the, the, and the re initial read write head is at this point, then it will, this content will be read first, then this content, then this content. So that is a sequential access. Okay. So say, uh, this uh, uh, semiconductor memories, they are mostly uh, uh, random access type and this uh, uh, secondary storage like say disk and all, so they are of this uh, uh, sequential access type. So in random access memory, access time is always same regardless of the particular location of the word. So it does not matter which location you are accessing, the location accessing location 100 or location 200, they take same amount of time. 
Whereas in a sequential access memory, the time takes uh, uh, to access a word depends on the position of the word with respect to the reading head position. As I was telling previously that since the disk is rotating and if the word that you are trying to access is close to the read write head, then it will be accessed much faster compared to the situation where, uh, where this, uh, uh, this uh, actual data point is will come much later. So, it is not uh, adjacent to the current head position. So, in that case it will take time for the disk to rotate and uh, the head get aligned to that location. So, this is the, uh, this is the problem. So, well, there is a sequential access and the access time becomes variable. So, in case of random access memory, so uh, depending upon the technology we can immediately find out what is the access time. Uh, but in case of uh, sequential access memory, so it depends on the uh, location that you are trying to access accordingly the access time will vary. So, static RAM or SRAM, so this is one type of um, random access memory. It consists of uh, essentially, essentially it has got latches that store the binary information. The stored information remains valid as long as power is applied to the un input. So, SRAM is easier to use and has shorter, uh, shorter read and write cycles, low density, low capacity, high cost, high speed, high power consumption. So, these are the features of this SRAM. So, this uh, low density means uh, per unit area how many such, uh, how many memory cells you can put. So, low density means, so you, you cannot make the density high. So, you cannot put large number of memory cells in a short, uh, in, a, in a small area low capacity. So, the, if the density is low, then naturally capacity will also be low because uh, the uh, how many such cells you can put into the chip. So, that way the capacity will be low. Cost is high. So, um, cost is high because uh, uh, you, you, you are putting less uh, cells there. So, the, uh, the cost is going to be high. But the advantage that you get is the high speed. So, speed of operation is high. The access time is faster. Power consumption is also high. So, these are the um, problems with static RAM, but still they are uh, used because of this uh, the speed, the high speed uh, property. There is another variant of this uh, RAM which is known as dynamic RAM or DRAM. So, it stores uh, the binary information in the form of electric charges on capacitors. So, uh, in case of static RAM, what happens is that, so conceptually a static RAM is like this. So, you have got two inverters which are connected back to back. So, which are connected back to back. So, once this is say equal to 1, so this is equal to 0, since this is equal to 0, so this is equal to 1. As a result, uh, this point will always remain as 0. On the other hand, if this value is say 0, then this will be 1, so this will be 1 and this will be 0 and that way this point will always remain at 1. So, this the, the static RAM, so uh, very simplistic structure, so that will be that can be formed by um, uh, connecting to back to back inverters. But that way uh, the cost of the system goes high. There are other constructions of this SRAM, so we will not go into that. But in case of dynamic RAM, what is done is that we do not have the such uh, back to back inverters, rather we have, we have we take a capacitor. So, the capacitor is charged and this capacitor is actually holding the charge. So, if you are trying to store a 1, so this capacitor is charged. And uh, so naturally, so it will be, so if you get, sense the value here, so you will get a 1. On the other hand, uh, uh, after some time of course, uh, uh, we, we cannot make a perfect capacitor, so this capacitor will leak. So after some time the voltage level uh, will come down as the charge leaks from this capacitor, so it will go towards 0. So this is the, uh, so what is, uh, what is required is that we need some sort of refreshing. So, this DRAM or dynamic RAM, it stores binary information in the form of electric charges on capacitors. The capacitors are provided inside the chip by means of MOS transistors. So, the, we have seen CMOS uh, logic. So, the MOS transistors we have seen there. So, they are uh, the gate of it acts as the uh, uh, acts as the capacitor. So, this uh, uh, so this gate value, the gate part of it acts as the uh, capacitor to hold the uh, bit pattern, uh, bit value. And the capacitors, as the capacitors, they try tend to discharge with time. So periodically, we must recharge the uh, uh, dynamic memory. So this, uh, compared to static memory, the which does not require any uh, extra circuitry for uh, doing for holding the value, 
So, in case of dynamic memory, periodically you have to read the content of the memory and write it again. So, that way we should have a refreshing circuitry. So, it is so apart from this, if this is your uh, DRAM chip, then along with that I should have a refreshing circuit. So, what this refreshing circuit does is that it reads the content of indi individual locations and write the same value there. So, as a so since it is written periodically, so this uh, the capacitors will get recharged and then the value will be restored to their original one. So, this is the idea of this uh, dynamic RAM. So, of course, we do not go into the circuit part. So, in case of dynamic RAM, so it offers uh, um, reduced power consumption. So, that is one of the largest advantage that we have with DRAM. Storage capacity is high because uh, only a single capacitor is needed for uh, making a DRAM chip, uh, sorry, a DRAM cell. So, uh, that way, uh, this uh, whereas in case of uh, your SRAM cell, so standard SRAM cell it requires 6 transistors, whereas standard DRAM cell it is requiring only a single transistor. So, that way the capacity is much higher and high density, high capacity, low cost, low speed, low power consumption. So, uh, this low speed because it requires this refreshing, periodic refreshing. So, speed is not that high as this SRAM, uh, SRAM configuration, but it is still used because very much because of this uh, high density and high capacity and low power consumption. So, memory units uh, uh, that lose uh, stored information when power is turned off is are said to be volatile. So, all these uh, chips that are static RAM or dynamic RAM that I am talking about. So, if, you, if the power is turned off then the content is lost. So, this type of uh, memory is they are known as volatile memory. Both static and dynamic are of this category since the binary cells need external power to maintain the stored information. There are non-volatile memories like magnetic disk and ROM that retains its stored information even after removal of power. So, in a ROM, so the information is stored permanently. So, you can uh, you can switch off the ROM, uh, but still get the uh, content there. When later on also the content will be there, but for RAM it will get destroyed. Next we start with memory decoding. So, memory decoding process, so this will be, uh, it, it will try to figure out like how this uh, addresses will be selecting a particular location and then, uh, so here uh, we can logically we can think of as if there is an SR flip flop and then this SR flip flop is getting selected by means of this read write lines. So, uh, so, this is just a logical diagram. So, ideally it does not happen like this. So, that is a, there are separate codes on memory design. So, that we will be talking about this cell design part. But for our course, so we will be looking into this logical diagram and try to understand the philosophy of operation.